Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearts today. It's actually the time of the year when we commemorate the Reformation that was started by Luther, October 31st, 1517, was the day that Luther nailed his 95 theses on the All Saints Church there in Wittenberg. He was 34 years old at the time, and Luther had been a man that was in a spiritual prison, desperately trying to be saved. He desperately feared the thought of eternity and eternal punishment that was awaiting. I think most of you know the story, how that it was during an electrical storm that he made some vows to become a monk. Have you ever been caught in an electrical storm before? I've been in several of them where the, elect- the lightning was bouncing right off the ground right in front of me. And I, believe me, I know the fear that he must have had at the time, but he made vows to become a monk, and he thought his life in the monastery would bring him relief. However, that was not the case. And his days in the monastery were filled with empty chants and hours of confession and self-affliction and penance. And um, none of that did the trick, did it? Long story short, he was later sent to the university at Wittenberg, and one of his mentors recognized his uh, academic ability, and he had him continue his study, and he went on to become a, a doctor of theology, and he was going to teach. I think what made Luther different from other monks was that he was educated. He was previously educated at Erfurt. He had a master's degree, just a thesis away from becoming a, getting his law degree. I mean, he was an educated monk. Most of the monks were not, but he was. And after Luther received his doctorate, he continued his study of scripture, and of course, he now had to engage with the students. He had to teach. He had to come out of himself, and he had to exegete the scriptures to his students. I think the first course that he taught was the Psalms, and actually wrote a commentary on the Psalms, but he was quite knowledgeable in Greek and Hebrew, and actually Latin as well, although he did not rely on the Latin, but from his previous studies there at Erfurt, but Now, Luther has to connect with his students, and he has to suddenly explain the scriptures to them, and it was during this time at Wittenberg that he discovered a verse that let him out of prison, and that verse comes from Romans 117, the just shall live by faith, and that is the verse that is on your October ministry calendar. Uh, this verse has been slightly misused and uh, or taken to the extreme. In fact, Luther was a bit imbalanced on this verse himself. But we can cut him a little bit of slack being, because of the darkness of the times, we'll cut him a little bit of slack on that uh, and we'll consider this shortly. But actually, this verse is used a few times in scripture, the just shall live by faith. Howbeit, uh, Habakkuk adds another hue to this verse in Habakkuk 2.4. Habakkuk 2.4. And it says, uh, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And that's a very important little point, that just shall live by his faith. Do you know how many times the word faith is used in the Old Testament? Twice. Twice. Once here in Habakkuk, 
and the other in Deuteronomy where the Lord says they are children in whom is no faith. No faith. Deuteronomy 32. But I later want to comment on that verse from Habakkuk. But coming back to Luther, Luther had been so bogged down with ritual and penance and endless confession, works that brought no relief to his soul, troubled soul, that this verse really let him out, really struck a chord, really let him out of a prison. You mean there's nothing that I can do to get saved except believe? That's right. That's what the scripture says. There's nothing you can bring. There's nothing you can have to atone for your sins. But And, of course, you remember the Philippian jailer. Um, he's asking what he must do to be saved in Philippians 16, 30. I'm just quoting part of the verse. He's saying to Paul and Silas, he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's Acts sixteen thirty, And Paul responds in verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Nothing else we bring except to cling to thy cross and the work that has been accomplished. How about Philip, the Ethiopian? Um, I'm sorry, Philip, who connected with the Ethiopian eunuch um, there in the desert, and the Ethiopian was saying to him, oh, well, what must I do? <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, Philip said, if thou believest, Acts 8.37, with all thine heart, if thou believest with all thine heart. And he responds and says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's how simple salvation really is. But, you know, initially that gets us through the door. And, um, but... There's a, a difference between believing and faith because believing comes from the human realm. Faith really is divine. Um, faith is an impartation whereby we know. Now, for example, I believe that God can heal me. Do you? Do you believe that God can heal you? But faith says, I mean, faith hears from heaven. This is divine. His faith. I know that God will heal me. There's a difference between I believe that God can. Faith says I know that God will. And faith is something that comes from heaven. We just can't muster it up. And I mean, there's a lot of people that proclaim that. But you really have to hear from heaven. God quickens something to you and you know that that's going to happen. Amen? Faith is an impartation whereby we know. I believe that God can heal me. Yes, but faith says I know that God can heal me. It comes from the divine realm. The just shall live by his faith. So believing says he can. Faith says he will. And that faith that we have comes from above. Now, coming back here to Luther, Luther was liberated by the fact that a man could be justified by simple belief because he was working, doing everything in his power to try to say, get saved and be saved. And, and there's no works accepted at the gate of salvation. But I think, you know, after Luther was liberated here by the by Romans one seventeen, I think he carried it a bit far because he was so liberated by faith without works that he failed to see the balance which talks about justification by works. And uh, I'll repeat that again, but at salvation we're justified by faith alone. There's nothing we can bring. Nothing we can do to atone, but believe. But once we're in the kingdom, 
There's action required. You don't just come through the gate of salvation and and sit there. In fact, I've spoken on this recently, but just to reinforce this gate, um, let's consider this, and especially for the sake of new believers. There are people who do listen to us on the broadcast, but Paul uses the word justified or justification 13 times in the book of Romans. But somehow Luther failed to see the balance between justification by faith and justification by works. And as we said, Luther was so liberated by justification by faith that he kind of went overboard with it. He couldn't see the balance to this truth. And so when he sees certain passages in the book of James, he wants to rip James right out of the Bible. He says, now this is contradicting Romans. And uh, it seemed contradictive. In fact, we'll look at a few verses where you can see the dilemma here. But uh, you have to put all scripture together. Amen? And all scripture balances each other. You can't just single out one portion and say, this is it. Now, you have to take it all into consideration because there's balance throughout the scripture. Now, in Romans 4 and verse 2, it says this. For if Abram, Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So it seems from that verse that none of Abraham's work were, works were justified by faith, but then when you compare this verse with other passages in James, you can see the the dilemma here. Let's move into James for a minute now. James chapter two and beginning in verse twenty. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? You know, in Romans it says he wasn't justified by works, and here it says he was justified by works. In verse 22, seest how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. You see the the balance there? Because... You know, we kind of prove our faith by our works. We can't just say and not do. There is some action required here. So James was saying we prove our faith by our actions, by obedience. So God told Abraham to offer up his son. And can you imagine Abraham just saying, okay, I believe No, he had to go through the motions, didn't he? He had to take his son, and he went as far as he was going to do it, and the Lord spoke from heaven, told it, I'm just testing you. But, um, you know, they complement each other. We believe, and our actions justify, you know, our belief. Amen? He had to put his belief into actions. And you might also note Hebrews 5.9. We could look at that verse, Hebrews 5.9. It says, And being made perfect, this is Christ, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Something people overlook. Obedience requires action. That's an act of faith. We're doing it by faith because we believe, we act. Amen? Now, again, I want to point out the difference between faith at salvation and faith through our continued walk. We don't just come through the door of salvation and sit down. And the Well, there are people that do that, and that's you see a pretty good picture of that. In John chapter 5, there's a multitude lying at the sheep gate, impotent folk. These are people that have done nothing but believe, come through and just sit down, and that's the end of it. But 
It's like the pilgrim in the pilgrim's progress. After he came through the gate of salvation, he had to begin a walk, didn't he? Which required some action. And so it is simply God's grace that allows us to come into the kingdom. But once we come into that gate, it begins a pilgrimage, just the beginning. So there's action required. There are rules in the kingdom that we have to obey. And uh, so it took some action on Abraham's part to complete the act of faith. Amen? Now, Jesus himself gives us a picture of the judgment day. And he's saying to various individuals, I was hungry, you gave me bread. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was in prison, you visited me. And actually, let's let's look at that in Matthew 25. Because we're going to see the left and right of things right here. And this is at the judgment. And uh, beginning in verse 34, 25, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. So, these people, these are people that are not only justified by their faith, but by their actions as well, by their works. And these enter the glorious kingdom. And if you continue to read this, in verses 41 through 46, you see the others on the left, and the Lord says the same thing to them, and they did nothing. And the Lord doesn't even allow them to enter the kingdom of heaven. They saw all of God's people. They never, they never put their, uh, well, what's the expression? Their money where their mouth is. They never put their, Action, they never substantiated their faith by action. But coming back to James again here, uh, James chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, Be ye not doers of the word. I'm sorry, be ye doers of the word. (laughs) One of these days I'm going to have to start wearing glasses here. And not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, or in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So, when you're in the kingdom, you can't ignore the rules, can you? Uh, nor the fact that this Christian walk requires action, right? Our works have to substantiate our faith. And James also describes pure religion like this. In chapter 1, he talks about pure religion is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And so the whole point 
is that good works should accompany our profession, our faith. Amen? Works should accompany our profession. Um, I mean, people should be able to tell that we're different from the world. I mean, if we have a, some kind of a confession that we're a Christian and don't act like one, I mean, you know, they say, well, they're just like us and they're a bunch of hypocrites and, you know, on and on. But there should be something different about us that our our actions should substantiate what we profess Still in James chapter 2 and verses 14 through 18, it enforces the same truth. Looking at verse 14 to 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Like those in Matthew 25, they did nothing. So the whole idea is that faith without works is dead. Our life, our actions, our whole lifestyle should complement, you know, our profession of faith. Amen? We want to live up to what we profess. As the old song goes, uh, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. You younger people probably don't remember that song, right? It goes back to the charismatic days. But on the other hand now, um, some people think that they can earn their way into heaven too just by living a good life or doing good works. And that doesn't work either. Again, we prove our faith by our works Because faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. The same is true concerning the commandments. If a man say, I love God and doesn't keep his commandments, what does that tell you? He's a phony. Doesn't it? He says, I love God, but he doesn't keep any of his commandments. You know, John says he's a liar. The truth isn't in him. And so looking at another verse in 1 John 2. 1 John 2, 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's uh, kind of a bad profession. Oh, yes, I know the Lord, but your actions deny it. I mean. So, the scripture exhorts us to make our calling and election sure. That means that we play a part in our destiny. We p- play a part. I know some of the the Calvinists, the extreme Calvinist view is, you know, we don't do anything and we're saved no matter what and all of that. But actually that can that can damn a person's soul too. But we make our calling and election sure by obedience. Amen. So this is what Martin Luther was dealing with. He spent a lifetime in bondage to ritual and, you know, all kinds of penance and self-abasement and whipping himself and all kinds of things, punishing himself, all kinds of penance and confession, hours of confession, and feeling no relief. And then simply, in just a moment, just, I believe that Christ atoned for all of my sin. You can imagine the burden that rolls off when he finally realizes that. Because he was doing everything under the sun, trying to be saved. And so he's set free by this little passage in Romans, being justified by faith, but See, what he struggled with, with was the idea of, you know, faith by works and, 
and justification by faith, you know, they actually complement each other. And he just he, he wanted to rip James right out of the Bible. He thought this is this is contradictory. But in short, our life should be a testimony to those around us. And we want to conduct ourselves as Christians, too. True repentance is a changed life, and it requires repentance, it requires change. And, I mean, if we say that we're one thing and our life doesn't measure up to it, I mean, people look on and say he's a phony. So faith faith is the assurance and conviction of a certain truth, as it says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, but also our confession of faith substantiates our faith. If we believe, then we must confess it. Amen? We want to confess our faith to people. Sometimes we're afraid to confess it, but you know, when we're standing at the judgment and people that we've worked with are standing at the judgment and they realize this person was saved, he never said anything to me, his... Or even if the person hates what you're telling them, at least they can't look at you and say, why didn't you say something to me, right? 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, uh, We having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. We should have a little confession to match up with our belief. And of course, as we said, repentance also gives credence to our conversion experience. People realize that we're different. I mean, I didn't, I came up on the wild side, not as though I wasn't taught right, but I went through those years where, you know, I was, certainly wasn't living it. But when I changed, I changed. When God dealt with me, I changed. Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Um, repent, that means to Change. And be converted. And actually we're finished here. But I hope we can understand a little bit more of of Luther's dilemma. Um, perhaps clear up some of our own questions on the subject. But true Christianity is a changed life. So our life should back up our testimony. And we're justified by faith. We're also justified by works. Both. By our faith and by our works. And again, our works should testify to our faith. See, Luther was coming out of the Dark Ages. And so, like I said, we can cut him a little bit of slack. I mean, he was off on a few things. He, um, you know, is anti-Semitic anti-Jew. In fact, even Hitler quoted some of Luther, (laughs) some of his anti-Semitic remarks. And even peasants, he was against the peasants. He he said, they're of the devil too. So he was was off on a few things. Uh, But, you know, he was, like I said, he was coming out of a very dark age too. Um, So you have to cut him a little slack there, but In these last days, God is perfecting his church. He is going to have a completed church. And, you know, there's not going to be any excuses. We're living in an enlightened age. And um, God wants his church to complete. And it's, it's not to be an ignorant church because the truth sets free. Amen?